Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today we will be looking at using loops in ladder logic. Let's look at our agenda for today. First, we will look at logic loops in computer programming languages. We will then look at applications where loops can be useful. We will also look at some techniques for creating loops in ladder logic. There will be demonstrations throughout and we will finish with a Q&A session. We will begin by defining logic loops in computer programming languages. A logic loop is a sequence of instructions that are continually repeated until a certain condition is reached. There are many different defining characteristics of loops. Today, we will focus on how many times a loop is repeated. We will look at two different types of loops. We will look at for loops, which repeat statements a fixed number of times, and while loops, which repeat statements a variable number of times. Ladder logic does not have for or while instructions, so in today's demonstrations, we will look at how to mimic these for and while loops in ladder logic for your application. Let's start with for loops. Here we can see the syntax for a for loop using structured text. We have built an index into the for loop, which is a starting and ending variable that through its value changes determines how many times the loop repeats. When the maximum of the loop's index is reached, we exit the loop. Now we will look at the syntax for while loops, also using structured text. With while loops, the statements in between the do and the end while statements in the syntax are executed while the boolean expression is true. The condition of the loop being mesh or not mesh is what causes the exit from the loop. The potential for an infinite loop with a while loop is much higher than with the for loop. This is because it is easier to set up a while loop with a condition which will never change. So if the condition set for a while loop is never false, the loop will run an infinite number of times. Let's look at some example applications for loops. Loops can be used to perform an algorithm such as finding an average on a set of data. This is because to do this, values would need to be handled sequentially. Loops are also a useful tool when searching a scanned barcode for a specific character. We will look at both of these applications of loops in our demonstrations later. As well as this, loops are also useful for searching an inventory list for a data match. Finally, Loops could also be used when printing archive dasha to a receipt printer if the dasha needs to be taken from various points and different batches. Now let's look at some techniques for creating loops in ladder logic. Here we want to mimic for and while loops for our logic, as ladder logic does not have for or while instructions. Let's start with for loops, which execute instructions a fixed number of times. To mimic a for loop, we first need to initialize an index by creating a variable for it. We then need to identify where the top of the loop is in our ladder logic. We then need to execute the instructions that are to be repeated. Then we need to manually increment our index into our ladder logic. We will then test the index to see if we have reached the maximum number of times we want to go through our loop. If we need to go through the loop more times, we need to jump to the top of the loop. If we have gone through the fixed number of times, we need to exit the loop. Now let's look at some key instructions needed when creating both for and while loops. First, we will look at the label instruction, which can be seen at the top of this ladder screenshot. Labels can be used to label sections of your logic or to mark a section in your program you want to be able to jump forward and back to. We also have the jump instruction, which we can see highlighted in the bottom of our screenshot. When executed, the jump instruction causes the program to jump either forward or backward to a specific label. In our screenshot, we are jumping backwards. We will also be using the indirect move instruction. This is often used in applications that require loops. The indirect move is a move block where either the source or the destination may be a pointer instead of a fixed location or variable. In the example in our screenshot, we have a source which is an array. 
This requires an index into the array or a pointer into the array to retrieve one of the array members. We will also be copying the value of the member into another fixed variable location. The variable in our example screenshot is called extracted value. In this example, we have an array called source data. The index variable will be read when the function is executed. This variable's value will be the pointer to the index into the source data array. This value at its specific location will then be copied to the extracted value variable. For our first demonstration, we will be using a loop to calculate the average on a set of analog values. To calculate the average of a set of values, we have to find the sum of the values and then divide that sum by the number of values. We will use a for loop to calculate the sum of the values. For our demonstration, we will have a series of analog values we have captured which can be stored in a series of percent %r registers if using register-based ladder, or in an integer array if using variable-based ladder. Our example today will be using variable-based ladder. We will create a loop that will find the sum of our stored analog values. The loop will go through the array, retrieve values one by one, and then add these values together. We will also have instructions repeating inside the loop that will retrieve an analog value from the list, add the analog value to the sum, and increment the index. When we have fallen out of our loop and have the sum of our values, we will then be able to calculate the average. Now we will look at the logic we have created to execute this application using a loop in Seascape. We will start with our main area of code. This code in our main routine will be calling a subroutine. We have put our logic for finding the average in a subroutine, however this can also be put in the main sections of your logic. In our main logic, we have a push button that will display on the touchscreen of our OCS. When this is pressed, it creates a one-shot positive transition coil and then calls the subroutine, which we have named average value. This is the code in the subroutine that executes our code to find the average. When we select average value here, we can view our label instructions. Our first label instruction labels the top of the subroutine. This is added automatically when a subroutine is created. Now let's look at the logic we have set up for our loop. Before our loop starts, we need to do initialization. Here we have a variable named index, which we will increment to keep track of how many times we go through the loop. To initialize our index variable, we need to make sure that it starts at zero. We also need to initialize our sum variable to zero, as we will be using our loop to find the sum of 20 analog values that have been stored in an array. Next, we have the label for the start of our loop, which we have named sum loop. At the top of our loop, we will first execute an indirect move and then retrieve a value based on the index from that value list. We will then take a value out and copy it to another variable called value. Once again, we have 20 values in our value list, so our index needs to be incremented from 0 to 19 so that we can point at the 20 different members of the array. Once we have retrieved our value, we will convert it to a double integer to accommodate a large result from the sum of the 20 members of our value list. This will help us to avoid overflow issues. The sum value starts out as zero when it first goes through the loop and will build on itself each time you go through the loop. This sequence will repeat each time we go through the loop. Next, we need to increment our index and then test the index to make sure we have gone through the loop less than 20 times as our index will range from 0 to 19. As long as we are at less than 20, we will execute our jump function, which will bring us back into the loop. Once our index is incremented to a value of 20, our condition will be false and we will drop out of the loop. We will then take our sum double integer and divide it by the number of values in our value list, which is 20, to get our average. 
Then we will return from our subroutine back into our main routine. Now we will look at our bench setup for this demonstration. Here we have our test values, which are the 20 members of the array. On the top right of our screen, we have the calculate button. This will cause the subroutine to be called that will calculate the average when pressed. When we press the calculate button, we can see that our program has calculated an average of 2,997. Now we will test our program by changing one of our test values to zero, which will cause the average to drop when we press the calculate button again. As we changed one of our test values from 3,000 to zero, our average has dropped to 2,847. Next, we will look at mimicking a while loop, which executes instructions a variable number of times. Once again, we first need to initialize an index. Although a while loop does not have an index, we will create an index to act as a safety net of a maximum number of times that we will go through the loop. This will provide us with an alternative way to drop out of our loop and help us avoid creating an infinite loop in case the condition for our loop is not met. This can be useful when using a loop to search through a large list. Once we've initialized our index, we will label the top of the loop and execute the instructions that we want to repeat. We will then test the condition of our loop. If we have met our condition, we will exit the loop. If we have not met our condition, we will increment our index so we can look for the next value or next part of our array and avoid an infinite loop. Finally, we will jump to the top of our while loop if we have not exited our loop. In our next demonstration, we will be searching a barcode for a specific character location. The scanned barcode string can be stored in either a series of percent %R registers with two characters per register if we use register-based ladder, or as a byte variable array if we use variable-based ladder. If our barcode string has 32 characters, then our byte variable would have 32 variable elements in it. We will create a loop that will retrieve characters one at a time from the barcode string. The loop will then compare each character against a target character, which will be the beginning of the part identifier that we are looking for. We will then increment one by one, looking for that character. If we find the character, we will drop out of the loop. If we do not find the character, and we reach the 32nd location, we will still fall out of the loop, as the index has reached its maximum. Once we have fallen out of the loop, we will report the character location where we found our character. If we don't find the character, we will instead report a negative one, to clearly indicate that we did not find it. Now we will return to Seascape and look at our code to mimic a while loop. Similar to our previous demonstration, we have a push button on the screen, which will trigger a one shot and then trigger a subroutine when pressed. We will then call the subroutine, which we have named find character. When we select the find character subroutine, we can see the labels that we have built into our logic. As before, we will first need to do initialization on our variables before we jump into the loop. For this example, we will set a variable called character location to a value of minus one. If we find the character we are looking for in the string, this value of minus one will be overwritten. If we do not find the character in the string in the barcode, it will remain at a value of minus one. Now let's look at our logic for inside the loop. Once again, we have a label that identifies the start of our loop. We also have an indirect move instruction. We will be retrieving a character from our barcode string of 32 characters, starting at the first member with an index of zero. We are using this moving block to move that individual character, which is a byte, into a variable called value to test. We will then check to see if that value we are testing is equal to the target characters. If this does match, we will turn on a bit that says match, and we know the condition of our loop has been met. If we don't find a match, we don't want to fall out of the loop. This is why we need to increment our index and make sure we haven't reached the end of the string. 
If we haven't reached the end of the string, we will then jump to the top of our loop and look for the next character. We will either fall out of the loop because we have found the character we are looking for, or we will fall out because we have reached the end of the stream because our index has reached its maximum value. After we fall out of the loop, if we have a match, we will copy that index value, which is the location we were pointing at when we got our match, as our character location with the character that we found. Now we will look at our bench setup for this demonstration. Here we have our example barcode scan, which consists of a series of letters and numbers. On our screen, we also have a box to enter our part identifier. Next to this, we will be able to see the starting location for our part identifier. First, we will enter a capital F as our identifier, and then press the Find Character button. Our identifier is found in the first character location, which would have an index of zero in our barcode string. This is why our character location is zero and not one. Next, we will change our part identifier to a capital Z and press the Find Character button again. Now we have an index of four, as Z is in the fifth character location. If our part identifier always started with a Z and had five numbers after it, then we could use the starting location to extract the part identifier from the barcode scan with another instruction or bit of code. That concludes our webinar for today. Thank you so much for listening and the Q&A session will begin shortly.